to present some of my research here. Um, I will, as Katya already said, I will talk about Calderon type inverse problem for the non-local tourist medium equation. I think for most of you, it's clear what I mean by Calderon type inverse problem. Namely, we have given some Dirichlet to Neumann map related to some parameter dependent partial differential equation, and we want to recover from is these a priori unknown parameters. But what I mean by non-local tourist medium equation is maybe a priori not that clear for some of you at least. Um, because of this, I want to introduce it here in equation one. Um, the terminology tourist medium equation comes from the fact that the non-linearity phi m u um, is given as the modulus of t to the power m minus one times t. And here we are only considering um, the case where m is strictly bigger than one. Um, this is the usual nonlinearity which one sees when studying the poorest medium equation. If t is positive, then it simply reduces to the mth power of t. <clears throat> the terminology non-local comes from the fact that the operator LK here is to be considered a non-local operator. More precisely, I'm assuming throughout the talk that it's an elliptic integral differential operator of order 2S. For these operators, I use the abbreviation Markov L0. If we are considering sufficiently regular function U, then it acts as the principal value integral as given in equation two. Here we are further assuming that the kernel function kxy is symmetric in both variables. And moreover, it's uniformly elliptic in the sense given in equation three. Then we have two other ingredients in equation one, namely the coefficient draw which is only a function of x. And also this function is supposed to be uniformly elliptic, meaning that it satisfies an estimate as in equation three. And then furthermore, we have a potential q also only dependent on x and not on the time t. Um, it's also assumed to be non-negative because the analysis in this case is easier because in this way, some monotonicity arguments work. Before proceeding, let me give you some special examples of elliptic integral differential operators, which you most of you maybe have already seen. Um, the first example is the one of the fractional Laplacian of order S. This is obtained when we formally take K equal to one up to a some constant, Clearly, then another example, which I studied heavily in my PhD thesis, is the one of the fractional conductivity operator. This one is obtained up to a constant if we take kxy to be equal to square root of gamma x times square root of gamma y. Gamma is also here um, a uniformly elliptic function. Then another interesting class of examples are fractional powers of second order elliptic partial differential operators, or more simply, one can take minus divergence of sigma time the gra times the gradient. For example, sigma could be a smooth function, um, also uniformly elliptic, such that it's in the exterior equal to one here and through uh, the talk by exterior of a domain omega, I mean the complement of the closure of omega. Now I can state more precisely what I want to discuss in this talk. Namely, I want to, to uniquely recover under suitable conditions as always the triple rho, k, and q from the partial Dirichlet to Neumann map denoted by lambda rho k q associated to the exterior value problem given in equation four. Here I wrote u to the power m because we are only considering for the inverse problem non-negative exterior conditions. As we will see, this implies 
directly that the solution U is also non-negative. Furthermore, let me note that the initial condition here is taken to be zero, as in many inverse problems for parabolic equations. If we formally take S to one, then the non-local poorest medium equation becomes the poorest medium equation with absorption term written in equation five, and the associated inverse problem has been studied some time ago by Garcia, Gosch, and Ullmann. And they, in fact, prove uniqueness result, unique determination results of the coefficient sigma, rho, and q. They have the generalized version of this, namely that the u of the potential could have some power. But here, we restrict ourselves to the linear case. And also the methods which we will use later on are also motivated by this work. But additionally, to solve our inverse problem, we need a unique determination in the elliptic non-local inverse problem, LKU equal to zero from the associated DN map, but only using non-negative exterior conditions because in the non-local first medium equation, we assume this from the very beginning. Then, Additionally, we need good properties of solutions to the non-local purest medium equation. In particular, we make use of a comparison principle. Because of this, let me next discuss a bit more elliptic non-local inverse problem. I start by giving a rate of channel formulation of elliptic non-local inverse problems. So let us consider our K an elliptic integral differential operator for the 2s as before. Qx star is a possibly nonlinear potential. And now we consider the Dirichlet problem given in equation six. So Lk u plus Qx u is equal to zero in a, let's say, bounded domain omega, u is equal to phi in the exterior of omega. Now, if we assume that this Dirichlet problem is well posed, then one can define the partial Dirichlet to Neumann map via equation seven, where phi is a test function in a measurement set W1. In the local case, this would correspond to the setting that we apply a potential in W1. Then we measure again some psi which is a test function in W2. Um, in the local case, this would mean we measure the current in W2. And here W1 and W2 are some fixed measurement set in the exterior of omega. So this is different to the local setting where they were restricted to some part of the boundary. And U solves equation six with precisely this exterior value. Five. Now we can pose the Natural question, does this DN map or this partial DN map, lambda KQ, uniquely determine the kernel and the Q? Now, there are a few special cases where the answer is yes. Um, the first non-local inverse problem studied in the literature was the case K equal to one and that the nonlinear potential is linear in U namely that it's qx times u. This is the fractional Calderon problem um, studied in 2016 by Gosch, Sala, and Ullmann. Then this has been generalized heavily afterwards. Um, again, k equal to one k, so the fractional Laplacian case, and qx u is of the form qx times f of u. Um, for example, Ijuan Lin studied the case of type, power type nonlinearities, so fu is equal to u to the power r. Then, together with Jesse Raylo, I studied the case where we have, again, a linear, that the potential is a linear function, so qx times u. k is fixed, and we showed that if lk has the unique continuation property, which I will recall afterwards, then the DN map lambda Q uniquely determines Q. So it solves the inverse problem in quite general setting when we want to recover an additional perturbation. 
now let me recall what I mean by the unique continuation principle. By this, I mean LK, I say LK has the unique continuation principle if LK u and u vanish in an open set v subset of Rm, then this implies that u is identically zero. This is a much stronger unique continuation principle as one knows for local elliptic partial differential equations. But here we are not interested in recovering the potential Q, but instead we want to recover the kernel K. This is usually much more difficult. And there are known results for the class of fractional conductivity operators, where is a strong link between the fractional Calderon problem and the non-local inverse problem for fractional conductivity operator. Then another class um, of operators or kernels we, which can be recovered is the class of fractional powers of elliptic operators, which I introduced before. Um, a recent paper of Govi, Gosch, Ruland, and Ullmann um, reduced or showed that the non-local DN map determines the local DN map, and then one can recover the conductivity or the coefficient sigma. Um, let me remark that simultaneous recovery of K and Q is usually much more difficult. This type of inverse problems appears, for example, in optical tomography problems. But in the class of L gamma, this is still possible, which I established in a recent paper. Um, but it's still an open problem whether this type of uniqueness result hold in other classes of L zero. Now, let me mention that in the non-local split equation, we only consider non-negative exterior conditions phi. Because of this, I want to make this definition of measurement equivalent operators. We say that LK1 and LK2, two um, elliptic integral differential operators are measurement equivalent written as LK1 tilde LK2 if the condition that the DN maps coincide for non-negative test function in W2 implies that K1 is equal to K2. Here I made the restriction that the measurement sets W1 and W2 are not disjoint. The reason for doing this comes from, a, from the observation that if the measurement sets would be disjoint, then one can actually construct counterexamples to uniqueness for the fractional conductivity operators. Now, one can ask the basic questions, are there classes of operators in L0 satisfying this definition that it really makes sense? And the answer is yes. A first class of examples are operators LK such that the kernel KXY is of the form F gamma X times F gamma Y. So they are separable where gamma is uniformly elliptic, real analytic, F is also real analytic. Um, F is furthermore injective and F has a positive lower bound on each compact set. Then these operators are measurement equivalent. Um, the argument why they are measurement equivalent follows from the exterior determination result for fractional P loss type equations, which I established together with Manas Kar and Ijwan Lin in 2022. Now, actually, the class nine can be generalized to a larger class of kernels KXY under merely the analyticity assumption and not the separability. The reason is that the exterior determination also works on the F of diagonal, but it needs, it needs some kind of geometric um, assumptions on the domain omega. Another more interesting class of operators are the fractional conductivity operators, um, where gamma is some uniformly elliptic function, the background deviation square root of gamma minus one belongs to the Bessel potential space H as N over S, meaning that the, the fractional 
of or the S half has some LNS, LN over S regularity. Um, furthermore, the gamma should be restrict in the exterior to some fixed capital gamma, which is again uniformly elliptic and the back, its background deviation has the same regularity. And furthermore, the potential which comes from the fractional lubel reduction has some continuity up to the boundary. Then the resulting non-local operators, LK, um, which are the fractional conductivity operators, are measurement equivalent. This observation follows from the low regularity theory um, for the fractional conductivity problem and the single measurement result for the fractional Calderon problem by Gosch, Ruland, Zalo, and Ullmann. Now, let me move on to the non-local porous medium equation. Um, the first needed ingredient is a well postness result. For this, we consider a bounded Lipschitz domain omega, uh, final time t, capital T bigger than zero, then uh, S, the fractional exponent, which lies between zero and one, and uh, alpha, which is strictly bigger than S, but smaller equal than one as usual. M is bigger than one, and LK is an elliptic integral differential operator. We assume additionally that the coefficient in front of the time derivative and the potential are of regularity C1 alpha on whole RM, and the plus indicates that they are non-negative. As previously, rho is uniformly elliptic. Um, these assumptions here we will make throughout the talk and assume it always. Then we prove that for any non-negative initial condition, which is bounded and in H tilde S omega, meaning it can be approximated in HF norm by test functions in omega. Then we have an exterior condition, which is non-negative, which is continuous in the time strip together with the exterior domain and compactly supported there. And that the m power of phi is now to HS then there exists a non-negative bounded and unique solution U in L infinity of the non-local Purus medium equation, given in equation 10. Um, let me sketch a bit the proof of this result, because later on we need such a kind of approximation result for the com comparison principle. Um, for this, we introduce um, functions phi, phi, epsilon, m, which are C1, and they are anti-symmetric, and the derivatives of them are uniformly elliptic in the sense of ii, and on compact sets, they converge uniformly to the nonlinearity phi m. Then, one can show that for any fixed epsilon bigger than zero, um, one can construct via Galerkin approximation a solution to equation 11, which I called regularized problem. Here, we basically simply replace the phi m by phi epsilon m. And the solution is indeed very regular. It's H1, L2, and L2, Hs. So it's the best regularity one can on the weak assumptions maybe hope for. The reason why the Galerkin approximation works for this regularized problem and not directly for the non-local Puris medium equation is that because the time der or because the derivatives of phi epsilon m are uniformly elliptic, one can establish the coercivity estimate in equation 12. Maybe let me explain a bit the notation which I used here. Um, the bilinear form BKUV is simply the bilinear, natural bilinear form associated to the integral differential operators LK given in equation 13. 
And if k is equal to 1 and u is equal to v, then equation 13 is simply the Gagliardo seminorm given equation 14. Now, if one uses the maximum principle for this, we need that q is bigger or equal than 0 and suitable compactness results, which one knows from parabolic equations, etc., one can conclude that this u epsilon weakly converts in L1 omega t to a function, to L infinity function, and this L infinity function solves equation 10. Now I will go to a longer theorem, um, the comparison principle to the non-local Cruise medium equation. And it has a bit of a special form. And the reason for this, you will see a bit later. Um, suppose we have given for j equal to one or two um, initial conditions, u zero j, which are satisfy the usual assumption in the well posedness result, the phi j also, um, we assume that phi to the power m phi j is in L2 HS. The reason why I write here phi m is that we don't assume here that phi j are non-negative. Furthermore, there are sources capital Fj, which are in L2. And uj should be the solution to the non-local poorest medium equation given in equation 15. Moreover, we are assuming that we can approximate suitably these f the sources fj by fj epsilon by phi j epsilon and u zero j epsilon. And we have solutions uj epsilon, which are in H1 L2 intersected with L2 HS. So these solutions has, have exactly the regularity which we know from the Galarkin approximation. Furthermore, we assume some kind of reverse low, lower semi-continuity result where we switched it. Um, in, in most applications, these inequalities turn out to be equalities. Furthermore, we assume that the initial conditions, u0j epsilon converge in L1 to u0j and the uj epsilon weakly converge in to uj in L1 omega t. Furthermore, the uj epsilon should solve the regularized problem given in equation 16. And with this assumption, we can show that there exists a constant c strictly bigger than zero, independent of the solutions, initial data, boundary data, and sources, such that equation 17 holds. This is precisely the type of comparison principle we actually need later on. Why? The reason is, on the one hand, we know that our solutions constructed for non-negative exterior data with zero initial data satisfy all the assumptions in this result. This is already one reason why we need it. Another reason is that our asymptotic analysis, which we do later on to solve the inverse problem, we can apply precisely this comparison principle. Let me give you a short sketch of the comparison principle or a proof of the comparison principle. We look at the regularized problems with solutions uj epsilon, and as usual, we go to the variable vj epsilon, where we simply subtract the exterior data that we have homogeneous exterior conditions. And we have to pay the price as usual that we get an other source here denoted by small fj epsilon. And if we subtract the resulting two equations from another, we see that the difference of v1 epsilon and v2 epsilon solve a nice equation given in equation 19. The g epsilon on the source on the right hand side um, simply collects all contributions of the other sources. Now, 
what we want to do is to use as a test function chi of phi epsilon m inserted v1 epsilon minus y epsilon m of v2 epsilon and multiplied by chi from the, from the interval 0 to t0. Here chi a is the characteristic function of the set a and chi it denotes the characteristic function of the positive free line. If one inserts this and observes that the characteristic function of this nonlinear, of the difference of this nonlinear expression is equal to the characteristic function of y1 epsilon minus y2 epsilon. After some calculations, one sees that we obtain equation 21. Here, one can first observe that on the left-hand side, the time derivative times the chi is simply the time derivative of the positive part of the difference of these solutions. And as a prefactor, we have rho, which is uniformly elliptic. So can be after some, using some um, fundamental theorem of calculus, it can be um, estimated from below or above with the other side. If we now estimate um, carefully the right-hand side and pass to the limit epsilon to zero, we precisely get the desired estimate. Now we have all this together that I can carefully define the Dirichlet to Neumann map. For this, I'm using the following notation. We are considering some set W in the exterior and define the set X S W as being the set of all continuous compactly supported function in the strip zero to T times W. Note that here phi is merely continuous and not smooth as otherwise. And phi is bigger or equal to zero and phi M is again in the space LHS. Then we can define the Dirichlet to Neumann map lambda rho kq via the definition 23. Um, this is the usual definition as for non-local elliptic problems up to the fact that we are integrating from zero to t. And here, as before, u is the unique non-negative bounded solution of the non-local Puris medium equation given equation 24. Now I can present finally the uniqueness result which we obtained. Namely, if we consider two measurement sets W1 and W2 compactly contained in the exterior, and these two measurement sets should be non-disjoint, if we assume that rho j, k j, and q j fulfill the usual assumption, which I introduced at the beginning, the non-local operators satisfy the unique continuation principle on HS, and LK1 and LK2 are measurement equivalent, then if the DF maps coincide for all phi in XSW1, then this implies that rho one is equal to rho two, q one is equal to q two in the closure of omega and the kernels coincide. To prove such a uniqueness result, we make now a first reduction. Um, for a given phi in excess omega exterior, and u is the unique non-negative bounded solution to 24, then one can observe that v, which is the nth power of u, solves the transformed non-local Puris medium equation given into equation 28. One simply takes the one over nth power of u in this equation and ma makes the, the usual adjustment. Um, here, the phi tilde is defined as phi to the power m. By the above or previous well posted result for the non-local Puris medium equation, one can see that equation, the transformed non-local Puris medium equation is well posed for exterior data 
phi tilde in the test space of, the, of defined on the time strip zero t times omega exterior. Here again, the plus denotes that these test functions are non negative. For this one, we simply redefine the phi as the one over m power of phi tilde. Because of this well posens result for this equation, we can again define the Dirichlet to Neumann map for the transformed non local Puris medium equation. This new DN map I denote by lambda rho kq to the power phi, and it's given in equation 29. So, what you observe is that somehow we simply replace also in the DN map um, the u to the power m by the v. Because of this, one can directly see that there is a direct relation between the DN map lambda rho kq and lambda rho kq to the power of phi. This implies clearly that it's now enough to show that the coincidence of these new DN maps implies that the coefficients are the same. And here we can test with nice exterior data, namely such which are in C infinity and compactly supported in the time strip zero to T times W1 and non-negative. So we don't anymore have to worry about this restriction. Next, I want to explain how we can solve um, the reduced inverse problem. The uniqueness proof is based on the one hand on ex special exterior conditions depending on a large parameter h, then it also relies on a time integral transform generating a solution to an elliptic non-local partial differential equation with a good right-hand side. And we make an asymptotic analysis of the solution to the elliptic PD in H and this will imply an asymptotic expansion for the DN map. Let me remark that these techniques already appear in the work of Garcia, Gosch, and Ullmann. The exterior data we want to consider are given here by phi tilde xt, where h appears linearly. Um, times t to the power m times phi tilde zero. This phi tilde zero is simply a test a non-negative test function in W1 and h is strictly bigger than one. Now we fix some capital time, but some time capital T zero, which is strictly, which is smaller equal than capital T, some exponent beta, which is strictly bigger than the maximum of one and I'm m prime minus one, where m prime is the Holder conjugate exponent of m. And we consider the time integral given in equation 31. And this is denoted by capital V. Note that we are only integrating up to time t zero. So somehow this corresponds to the fact that we only observe the nonlinear effects in the Puri's medium equation or of the poorest medium up to capital time T zero and not up to the initial time, which we consider capital T. Now, one can observe that this capital V solves the equation 32. So, so a solution of LK V equal to minus M plus M and has some additional exterior conditions um, here, the notation is the following. Um, the capital B is the Euler beta function, which appears due to the performing some time integrals. And the M and N are given by the into time integrals in equation 33. Now, it's important to note that M and N are both non-negative and by using some Holder inequalities, one can show that they can be upper bounded by v to the power one over m, 
times some t0 to some exponent, which will be important later on. And also um, explains why we have chosen the beta in such a way as we did. Um, these pointwise bounds, on the one hand, allow us to control the L2 norm of M and N. And these, in turn, show um, that we have an energy estimate for V as given in equation 34. Note that here, again, H appears linearly. So this HS estimate for V and that V in the exterior um, is given as here in equation 32, motivate that we make the following asymptotic expansion as given in equation 35. Here, the, in this asymptotic expansion, the first term or the first function V to the power zero is a solution to the homogeneous equation for LK with exterior condition Y tilde zero. Then we have additionally a remainder term. This remainder term um, genera generates the source for the function V, namely minus M plus N, but has zero exterior condition. Then using estimates quite similar to the ones before, one can show that the, that a, that LK R1 has in H minus S omega, the decay H to the power one over M. This will be quite important now because we want to do in a second, another more finer asymptotic expansion. For this, let me introduce a new function, small v zero, which is, which is given as H power m times capital V zero. Um, this function has some nice regularity properties, which we will need later. Um, based on the asymptotic behavior, which we saw for R1, we refine the ansatz to, to have the R1 decomposed in two further terms, namely H to the power one over M, times V to the power one, plus a further remainder R2. Here V1 solves again an elliptic equation, but with new functions, M1 plus N1, and we put the H1 over M from the previous asymptotic expansion on the right-hand side. Here, more precisely, M1 and M N1 are given by the equation 42. Observe that here M1 has again the rule as a prefactor and N1Q. Luckily, we can actually compute these integrals and again obtain something which is, which is a multiple of V0 to the power 1 over M. And both both quantities has as a common prefactor h to the power one over m. Consequently, we see that the remainder r2 needs necessarily to satisfy the equation 43. Here on the right hand side, we have the difference of m minus m1 and n minus n1. So for doing this estimate, we need actually a relation between small v and small v0. This can be obtained if we observe that this v0 solves equation 44. So it solves the transform, transformed non-local course median equation with q equal to zero, but with a right-hand side and with a non-negative exterior condition. So if one considers this equation on compares to the transformed non-local tourist equation for V, 
after taking the term containing the potential on the right hand side, one can do some computations and can observe that the comparison principle with Q equal to zero in the non-local Cauchy's medium equation can be applied. And one really obtains that V zero is bigger equal than V. Using for the equation 45, meaning this relation between V zero and V, we can now prove that R2 can be controlled in HS norm. In fact, we obtained that the HS norm of R2 decays as h to the power one over m squared. Now, in the next step, we want to introduce some special type of test functions, psi w h to the power sigma, where sigma is now for the moment simply a positive number. And this psi w h sigma is given in equation 47. So we have up to time capital T zero, um, h to the power minus sigma times this usual prefactor, which we already have seen in the time integral transform times wx. And here w is a C infinity functions compactly supported in w2. Then if we insert it in equation or in the definition of the DN map, then after switching time integrals and bilinear forms, we can see in the first step that the DN map tested against this can be written as h to the power minus sigma times the bilinear form of capital V and tested against small w. And now in the second step, we can insert our second asymptotic expansion and finally obtain the result given in equation 48. Um, it's noteworthy that for the capital V zero, we have as an prefactor h to the power one minus sigma. For capital V one, we have h with exponent one over m minus sigma and the h minus sigma for the remainder term R2. Now, if we take, the idea is now to take sigma equal to one in the first, for the first term in this expansion, then all the other two terms go to zero in the limit h to infinity. Then if one neglects the first term and takes a sigma equal to one over m, then the h disappears for the second term and the loss term still goes to zero because R2 goes to zero at infinity like one over m squared or h to the power one over m squared. Now, with these observations, I can finally sketch the uniqueness proof of our result. Namely, as I explained, taking sigma equal to one and passing to the limit h to infinity, we see that this action of the DN map on these functions is simply a constant multiple of the action of the DN map for the non-local equation LKJ times phi zero till the acted tested against W, small w. Now, since we assume that, recall that maybe here that these phi tilde zero are supposed to be non-negative. Because of this, we need to make the assumption that kj or lkj are measurement equivalent. And this now implies that k will be c to k2. Now, for the uniqueness of the remaining coefficients, we observe that if we take sigma one over m, take the difference of the DN maps because we know the kernel are the same. The, in the asymptotic expansion for these two different capital V's, the first term, the V zero needs to agree as well. We see the first term vanished and the remaining term and the remainder 
goes to zero in the limit h to infinity. And so the only term which remains is the one given in equation 15. Now one can simply wonder, yeah, what does this mean? And the answer is simply, yeah, it means that v1 to the power one minus v2 to the power one on the one hand vanish in the exterior. And on the other hand, if we hit it with the LK or LK1, because the kernels are the same, um, they are equal to zero in the measurement set W2. Now one can invoke the unit continuation principle, which we assumed from the beginning for the integral differential operator LK1, and sees that V1 is equal to V21 in the whole Rn. Now we simply subtract the Dirichlet problems for V11 and V21 and see that we obtain equation 51. The reason is that the, this integral on the right hand side is simply the, the right hand side of the previous Dirichlet problem. Now, what we want to do is in equation 51, we take in the first step, step the limit t zero to zero, such that the term containing the potential vanished. And what remains is that we have rho one minus rho two times v zero to the power one over m is equal to zero almost everywhere in omega. Now one can rely on a contradiction argument such that one sees that rho one is equal to rho two in omega because um, the V zero cannot be identically zero as it has a non-zero exterior condition. Now one can again look at the equation 51 and also sees that by the very same argument, that the potentials Q1 and Q2 also need to coincide in omega or even the closure of omega by our continuity assumption. Um, the results presented in this talk um, are from the joint work with Ijuan Lin, um, having the title Unique Determination of Coefficients and Kernel in Non-Local Cori's Medium Equation with Absorption Terms. This was all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip, for the very nice talk. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions, please? Okay, Philip, can I ask a very, very small question? I mean, it seems to be that somehow this measurement's equivalence, I mean, for the kernels, I mean, is crucial, right, for your result. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and you have some very nice examples. And for example, on page 11, you have example of this fractional conductivity equation. Can exactly. I ask you a small question related to this? Sure. Oh. Probably. Oh, probably page ten. Right. So you mentioned some. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you, in order to prove, I mean, this result, right? You use a single measurement mm -hmm. result. I mean, for fractional Calderon problem. And just for curiosity, yeah. I mean, why is a single measurement result? I mean, to result to be important. I mean, for this proof. Uh, because we can only test with non-negative functions. It is a, a really cheap way to get it right. Because oh. I'm simply saying, yeah, we can only test it against non-negative functions. This holds for one function, so let's take this result. For sure, there one can strengthen these examples by not relying on such a strong result. I see. I see. Like the single measurement. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. 
Okay, if not, thank you very much, Philip, for the very nice talk once again. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, Thanks. for coming. Thank you.